So Peter, thanks for your time today. It's, it's great to have you. I think people are going to be really interested in understanding how your career's progressed, but then more importantly, some of the lessons you've learned along the way that you can that you can share with some of uh, the audience. And so as a starting point, can you just give us an intro into who you are, what you do, and why people should watch this video? Sure. Well, thanks very much for having me on. Um, my name's Peter Ely. Uh, I'm the EUC practice lead uh, at a company called Bytes. Um, we are a, a business that have typically just served uh, licenses and software solutions um, to the UK market. Um, and we've had success over the num a number of years um, to the point where now, because of our predominance in Microsoft reselling, um, we, we're kind of, we're seeing less demand for that and more sort of scalable and solution scale products. So that's where my role really is focused on. I'm, I'm um, focused on helping customers specifically within EUC to, to make the most of what they're doing from a licensing perspective, but um, also attach on whatever it is they need to, to make that solution work within their business. Yeah, perfect, nice. And so wh where did your career, your career, career start out? So um, obviously not, not like a day-to-day -day account for over the last God knows how many years, right? But at a high level, where did you start and how did it progress? Started out very, very junior. Um, I mean, I left college. I did a, um, a course at college uh, around uh, IT um, um, business. Uh, I think it was a business course uh, at college and um, just went straight into an IT junior role, at, uh, an insurance broken uh, firm in the, in the city of London. So it was very entry level, um, very basic, very sort of... Um, uh, first line support um, as, as an IT junior, really working underneath the the, the, the IT, uh, head of IT at the time. Yeah, perfect. And then from that role, what, what, what made you go into the channel rather than being in, in internal IT? Um, well, I, I suppose from there, I just kept on moving. You know, I, you eventually outgrow what you're doing um, within any business, I think, and and if you aren't given the scope and the resource to kind of progress, you have to move on, um, and, and that's what happened. That happened just not just once, but a number of times. Um, dabbled in sort of uh, doing a bit of uh, contract work and uh, going independently, um, and, and then kind of just kept challenging myself along the way um, for new things to learn, um, and then eventually, I think you don't choose to end up in the channel. It just kind of draws you in and you end up here somehow, whether it's on a vendor or for a reseller uh, selling solutions, uh, somehow you'll end up there. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I think when I started out, I faced similar kind of internal support IT role. And then I really wanted to be a consultant. I don't actually know why, right? I think it just sounded good at the time. And I really wanted to be a consultant going in and implementing technology for, for people and doing different things on a different every day. And um, I was very fortunate that, well, I say very fortunate, I applied for the role and got told I wasn't uh, certified to do it. So they didn't employ me. Um, and then they phoned me back about a month later and said, actually, um, would you like to have a shot at it? Because they couldn't find anyone for the money they were willing to pay, ultimately. Yeah, yeah. And at that point, it was literally all, all hands on deck and get things done for people, right? And it was definitely a learning curve from being in internal IT, of basically keeping lights on. I think that's the thing you, you kind of hit the nail on the head with is that when you're a consultant, it's a different environment. So each each week or every couple of weeks, you're working with a new set of IT personnel, a new environment, new infrastructure, and it's completely different to the way it was done beforehand. All that you've got is consistently is a built up experience of having worked in different environments. And that's what you can't buy without sort of really entering that field and, and doing it. So the hands-on experience, you, you, you can't fault. You have to move around, unfortunately, to, to, to get that. But yeah, that's, that's, that's something that's quite exciting about being a consultant. Yeah, definitely. So when, when do you think about your day-to-day -day now? What does a day in the life uh, of Peter look like at Bytes? What, what do you end up doing? Well, I'm targeted on sales numbers now. Um, whereas before, I didn't, didn't really care about sales it was just like consultancy and you know delivery uh, and implementation and perhaps you had a, a view on making sure that you 
were always billing days and that was about it but now I've, I've actually got I'm targeted and sales numbers so every day I suppose I'm, I'm keeping an, an eye on sales numbers um, I'd say probably on average I'm, I'm having about eight to ten custom calls a week where I'm giving them steer um, talking to, talking to them about the market uh, what changes we're seeing what vendors are recommending what other customers are doing um, so it, ha- it means I have to be up to date with latest tech um, understand customer difficulties and really find a way of helping customers see the value of an investment um, which is different from just really knowing a, a technology stack and being able to implement it it's it's really understanding value and costs and whether a, a customer will be able to uh, really see that that's going to be worthwhile investing in and, and helping them with that yeah definitely and I know that in, in my role it's, it's, it's very similar I don't, I don't have a target fortunately which is a good thing for me because I think that having a big number of my head would scare the living hell out of me I think also to a degree we kind of I know this probably doesn't happen because ethically and morally it would be wrong but it, it also means you're keeping an eye on something that's not relevant for the customer right um, mm. obviously it's relevant for the business you work for um, I think from my my day-to-day uh, activities when I when I'm in, in the employment that I'm under, it is all customer facing predominantly other than my other part of my role of managing and leading people and set, setting a direction, which is a whole different conversation. Um, I, I think that when customers come to us as, as experts, right? That's what they maybe see us as, or as, as advisors, opinionative people, they, they expect us maybe to have the answer. And one of the things that I've been trying to distill down to some of the junior people that have joined um, CDW is, you don't have to know everything. Right? You don't. You don't. You don't need to be the guy that knows what widget does what in every single location. You just need to be able to have a logical way of working it out and providing an opinion on something. And I think the opinion in this consultative arena is critical because if you just keep on banging the same drum as every other reseller, as an example, or, or what the vendor tells us to talk about, right? And then we we go out there and sell the dream and then come to deliver it, and then that technology doesn't work for whatever reason. So yeah, I think it's yeah. a very close line between sales, technical, and bringing the business things together to make sure it's going to deliver the right outcomes. Yeah, and you're right, you know, and, and you know, sometimes, um, you know, you can make a recommendation and, and a customer can either shoot it down or, or completely go against your recommendation. It can crush you and you can feel as though, you know, you're really worthless and your opinion sucks, but actually... Um, you're dead right you know all you've done is used your knowledge and experience and your knowledge of what the market's saying to really push a recommendation and it's not based on what your your business necessarily are pushing you to push Um, it it can be genuinely and especially from my point of view and, and your point of view it is you know we are sort of giving our professional opinion uh on these things um so yeah it, it can hurt but you know, you're right. It's it always go with what your professional opinion should be, um, rather than you know what the customer wants to hear a lot of the time. And and you know, I think that's um, don't don't sort of put yourself under too pressure, too much pressure. Is it is is definitely one of the things I'd say. So, what what would you say has been your most memorable moment in your career to date? Most memorable moment. Um... I suppose it's quite interesting. When I was looking at this question, there's a lot that's happened while I've been in IT. Uh, 9-11, one of the most significant moments in a lot of people's lives. But one of the things being in IT that affected us the most, I think anyone who was in IT during those events, internet crashed. um, And that that was quite big. So not only was everyone rather distracted by what was going on, stateside but and was very paranoid if you're working in the city of london there was a big paranoia that you're going to be hit yourself but the internet just went mad crashed a lot of systems went down um that was a big impact massive massive memorable moment uh, i actually also remember the millennium bug um when nothing happened in, in the year 2000 um but I mean, they're, they're some, I suppose, significant events that happened that stand out for me, um, that kind of impacted what I was doing in IT at the time. But I think the, the memorable moments that stand out for me 
for work-wise are the moments when you used to love going to work because of the people you work with. Um, they're, they're the bits that really stand out for me. You know, I used to work in a team where every day was just uh, just a bag of laughs. It was just brilliant. Um, and they don't sort of seem to tend to stay like that for very long, you know, but make the most of those moments. Um, and uh, yeah, in, enjoy them while you can. But they, those sort of things really stood out for me. I know when I think back about the, the relationships I've built through working with people over the years, and don't get me wrong, I've got a pretty good relationship in various teams I've worked in over the years, but I always look back to when I was in, when I was at Enterprise PLC doing internal IT, but because I was literally living and breathing in the same organization for six years or more, well, it might have been more than six years, the relationship with those individuals is, is non-comparable to what I've had over the last 10 years with the, with the rest of the roles that I've had. And I think it's purely because I literally lived and breathed each other's lives for that long in that scenario, whereas in the last 10 years, I've been chopping between organisations and roles and various other bits and bobs. It's just not the same, but yeah, I do miss those days to an extent. I think one of my friends said to me the other week, if, 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 if earning money wasn't what you wanted to do and you didn't mind um, doing any job on the planet, we we're talking about what, what we would go back to maybe doing, right? And we were talking about when we were in, in college, we used to work at Morrison's Warehouse. So in a big warehouse, stacking boxes, putting things in punnets, all that kind of stuff. And we sat there thinking, we kind of took it as a bit of a joke, right? Because you were in college, it was only a weekend job. You didn't take it too seriously. But looking back, that was probably the most fun I've ever had in any job. Yeah. <laughs> but it's probably true. doesn't take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah, you're dead right. Uh, and, and that's, you know, it's a lot of people sort of, they'll, they'll go to further their career elsewhere. And we've all made those, those mistakes where we have sort of made sort of um, uh, bad errors in judgment with, with sort of career moves. But um, a lot of the time you don't factor in the people that you work with. If, you, if you're working in, with good people, um, moving to, an, to another business is not necessarily going to be able to be exactly the same. Uh, and so, yeah, figuring that out is, is something of a lesson sometimes. Yeah, definitely. So on, on things of like mistakes, which is the, the biggest mistake you've made and the lesson you learned from it? Yeah. Um, I, I've made tons of mistakes, right? Um, and you, you, I, I just, I think like every, every mistake you make in IT, you always learn from, you know, if, you've, if it's that you did something when you didn't follow a best practice you, or, you, or you didn't, make a backup of something before you made a change or it, we've all learned those lessons and um but I, I think i think sometimes it's professionalism uh provides the best uh lesson for you that, that you can't sort of um uh dismiss at any time i, I remember i was asked by um a company director to to come down and help out this is one of my first jobs help out with like I think they were trying to connect a, a, a laptop to a, a projector or something like that and get it on screen they couldn't figure it out and they asked me to come and sort it out and then while I was sorting it out that the, the director in front of the customers was being like you know come on get on with it you know sort of a bit like this with me and I answered him back mm -hmm. big mistake in front of customers um, and I did get a bit of a spanking about it, um, but it taught me a, a lesson, you know, just to remain professional throughout. Um, and I think not just with, um, you know, executives and customers, if you've got to do that, but, you know, through, throughout your career, you know, just make sure you remain professional in all of the things you do. So don't make cutthroat decisions because someone's annoyed you. Um, show a bit of professionalism about it you know always make sure you've you, you'd be a man about certain stuff um as much as that might hurt and on that occasion yeah it was it was killing me that i was getting bad mouthed in front of these customers so i felt it necessary to fight back and that was just me being a little teenager with a with a bit of a chip on my shoulder but you know those those kind of lessons are, are worth taking away just to always maintain your professionalism yeah definitely and if you were if you're looking back to your younger self, right, in that kind of situation and, and various points in your career, what would be the top three tips you'd, you'd give yourself now? 
Um, I think it's one of the things I've, I've always, I always sort of maintained is um, I never focused on how much I was earning. And I think that was because I was given good advice about that. Um, someone has always said to me, you know, don't compare what you're earning to what your mates are earning because you will catch them up. Um, and so through those, you know, early days of my career, never looked at what I was earning. Um, and eventually over time you do, you catch up and overtake all your friends and, you know, you, you end up sort of doing quite well for yourself. It's, it's a good industry to sort of get into to earn quite well. Um, so I think that was, that was for me, was the best advice I got given because it, it allowed me to remain focused. Um, but other three tips, I'd say, um, find what you're good at in this industry and, and pursue it. You know, um, if you find that it's, it's infrastructure is, you, you find cloud infrastructure far more interesting, you're better at that than cloud app development, then go down that route. You know, when I was first getting started in IT, everyone was into web development and I was terrible at web development. Um, and so I'm so glad I didn't do anything web development because where's web development now? It's it's like dying art, you know. Um, so I'm I'm kind of glad with the 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 where I did. I, I pursued my efforts into what I was good at, and, and that's where I went. So that's that's probably a second tip I'd say. And a third tip: just stay humble. Um, you know, always admit that you know you're not always going to have the answers, like you were saying before. Um, Admit someone will be better than this uh, than you at some point. Um, uh, that, you know, you, even in sales, there's there's going to be sometimes you're going to lose deals. It, it's it's the way things are. But just just remain humble, uh, and people will like you for that. And I was speaking to um, a friend that works at a, another reseller in the industry, and he was saying that he's come from a very small organisation where he was big fish, right? knew everything the guy that got all the questions everyone went to him with things he was the person that everyone relied on so he kind of got a bit of a an ego right um and then joined a slightly larger organization just before covid hit and he's now a little fish <laughs> and he's starting again right and he's trying to build his brand and all that kind of stuff and i think his first week was an eye opener for him because he, he literally sat down at his desk at home and connected in and he was like i have absolutely no idea what i'm doing or what anyone does it's a completely different role to what he was doing as well. <laughs> yeah, um, so and I think that he's very fortunate the people that he's working with. I, I know a few of them and they're very they're very humble. They're, they're very good to, they're happy to work with people and to train people up, which is good because he, he's going to need that. I think he's going to have a rude awakening over the next few few months, if not years, while he's at that, that organisation. Mm. Cool. So final question on, on career. Um, what... Was there any point in your career where you've been, you feel like you've been pushed to the limit, the limit of getting ready to quit, handing that notice in, and then you've sat down maybe and gone, right, I'm going to overcome it rather than just quitting, right? Because we don't want people to quit their jobs. Um, so is there any scenario where that's happened and then you've overcome it? Yeah, I mean, plenty of times I've, I've been in job roles where I think there was one job role I turned up um, and after about an hour of being there, I wanted to quit. Um, consultancy uh, can be relentless you know it can be really really hard um, you can be sent away for weeks at a time um, you're miles away from your family and friends um, you've got heavy demands heavy expectations um, and, and you know one minute you can be up in Preston and then the next minute you've you've got to be down in South London you know, and it's a completely different environment and you've got to think on your feet and because you're being charged at a day rate, um, people have, the, the customer's got big expectations of you. So it's not like you can start Googling the answers and stuff. You've got to be expected to know the answers when they quiz you. There's, it, it can be really relentless. Um, and at times you can just think to yourself, why am I doing this? I'll just go back to a simple job a simple IT job um, and, and pack all this in. Um, there's plenty of times I've felt like that. Yeah, and I think, I think thing, like, pressures, right? And it's pressures from customers, pressures from peers, pressures from management. 
pressures on the industry and trying to keep up with technology change. And then at some point it does feel like it's, it's overwhelming. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when it, it impacts sort of, um, you know, you can impact the amount you, you see in your family. Um, if you're staying away a lot and that you, you, you start to reassess. And I think that's what you have to do is you, you just have to kind of sit back instead of making a, a decision that's very snappy um, and just walking away. Yeah. you have to sort of be grateful for the fact you have got a very important job role um, and then sort of assess what you're going to do going forward about it. And whether that means talking to the white people in your business to, to evaluate that or evaluating what you do long term, but don't make a decision, like don't walk away from it. You might feel like wanting to do it, but I, I don't think I ever made that decision uh, necessarily. Yeah, and I think there's another element to it as well. Is like if you don't feel like there's someone in your own organisation you can speak to about it, I think my answer also is reach out to the community or even your family yeah. uh, and just try and they might not understand the industry or the technology areas, but they'll be able to give you some, some advice based on your own individualism and who you are, right? Because they're going to know you're going to be doing something that ethically, morally, or even just isn't right by your own persona. Yeah. Um, and the community, again, I think people... I think for anyone joining the industry, I think the first thing I'm advocating for everyone is just get involved in the community. Whether you're actually inputting and standing on stage and presenting and doing all that kind of stuff or just consuming that information and networking and sharing your insights. I think I've got friends that have been made redundant during this, this, this pandemic and the biggest thing they're looking for now is looking for new jobs. And because they've built a pretty good community network, they've got a job almost instantly doing what they were doing previously, but elsewhere because they had the reach into the, the other organizations through networking, right? And I've got other friends that just don't do those kind of things and they're on job sites, they've got recruiters looking for jobs left, right and center for them and all that kind of stuff. And actually it would have probably been easier and more cost-effective for an organization, right? Um, to go down the route of community-based um, recommendations well, a lot, rather than- a lot to be you know, said for, for the network that you build up in this industry. Um, I, don't, I don't think I would have, um, necessarily been able to have half the jobs that I've been able to have without the network of, of um, friends and you know um, industry peers that I've built up over the years. So you're absolutely dead, dead right at that point. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so on on the industry, right? So obviously, it's a lot's changed since um, since well, we both started. Um, but we pick on like a, a main highlight, right? So, what's the biggest change you think that's happened since since starting out? It's been. I mean, I've been in the industry a long time, right? So, um, yeah, twenty plus years. Um, so, when I started out, the first job role I had, nobody in my business had internet access. Um, only directors had external email. So we could all internally email each other, but no one could email externally. Uh, there were fax machines still heavily in use in, in my office. Um, we were just in the process of getting rid of like a, a Wang environment or so Windows based model. Um, and like I said before, web development was what everyone was getting into. The internet was starting to boom. So it's nothing like it is today where everyone is connected um, everyone has information like that. Everyone has data everywhere. It was very, very siloed, very, very specific, uh, and very, very simple. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's changed magnificently, but in, in a wonderful way. It's like you know, it's presented us with challenges we never foresaw. It's presented us with uh, the ability, like we have now, for all of us to be able to work from home. If this had happened twenty years ago. There's absolutely no way businesses would have been able to carry on. Mm. Um, if this had happened five years ago, there's no way businesses would have been able to carry on. So you just think that even in a five-year gap, we've seen remarkable change in this industry that's really enabling us to do what we're doing right now. It's incredible. And that's that's just, you know, testament to, to the fact the industry is moving at an incredible pace. Yeah. And I think that when I look up, when I originally started out and if I skipped the first job role because that was yeah it's not really worth talking about if I'm honest and I've got Morrison's. too many negative comments to make about that than positive um but if I move on to like my, my first role when I was at Enterprise um I actually 
during then they were still running a novel directory services environment right they were they had a couple of mt4 machines lying around they were looking at migrating to ad moving away from group wise to exchange services and all that kind of stuff and then over the six years of being there we went from that environment with old servers that were stained with cigarette tar being brutally honest right <laughs> through to having a vmware virtualized environment on vmware 2.5 or v72.5 release to running emc uh, running emc cx4 clarion storage arrays cisco call manager environment rather than an old pbx solution through to then a Citrix estate at the time for what 20,000 users that was managed by one person without provisioning services. And that person was me. And I'll be completely honest, it was brutal, it was horrible, and I really wish they'd have invested in provisioning services. Um, but they're the kind of things that that just in that short window, they're just like some highlights that I saw change just in my first half decent career role. But then when I went into consultancy, it opened my eyes to to too much to a degree because every customer's demands and requirements were different and you were looking at different technologies to meet those solution requirements or business outcomes right and you were you were investigating technologies that were right on the top of the wave for some organizations and they're cool projects right they're the things that everyone wants to get involved in and then you end up going to an organization that's still running the vel directory services and you're on that that baby step journey out of that scenario. Yeah, yeah. That being said, I still think that NDS is brilliant <laughs> and so simple compared to the likes of Active Directory. Yeah, it was, it, and it's such a shame that it never um, really matured uh, and kept up, to be honest, but it's the uh, Microsoft beast that they are. Yeah, 100%. Throw money at it and you'll get there someday. <laughs> <That's> right, <yeah. laughs> so on um, technology, so what is taking your interest at the moment? Um, so there's a really interesting uh, piece of technology um, that is taking my interest. Um, they're a company called 8th Census. Um, they've got a really cool piece of tech, which um, is like no other uh, piece of tech at the moment. So it's, it's identity based. Um, and what's interesting about it, it it's, it's actually sort of coming at a, a really interesting time. Um, the, the, the profile that you see on screen right now, um, it, it's, it sort of recognises your facial features, your presence, your sort of shoulders and everything about you and learns all about your facial movement and your, um, your posture and everything like that. But also your keystrokes, your your the way you type, the way you move the mouse, it learns all of this stuff about you. Um, and then if there isn't any sort of change to that, it will lock the screen. So if, for instance, right now someone was to, if I was running the software on this screen right now, and someone was to come behind me, or just their hand was to appear, it would blur the screen instantly, so that that person mm. wouldn't be able to see what's on the screen. Um, and it's it's very interesting for the scenarios where you have the likes of call center staff that are now working from home. Um, how can we guarantee that these call center staff uh, don't have someone else in the room that is looking over their shoulder at your data? Um, it's very interesting for that. Um, I, I had to take my son to go and get his jabs earlier and the nurse who did the jabs, she walked out of the room for two seconds, but she left her screen unlocked. Um, with this software, you leave your screen, it locks instantly. Yeah. So there's, there's really interesting sort of use cases for where you're seeing the protection of data as a real use case. That for me is really grabbing my attention. We're, we're, we're lo looking to uh, work with 8th Census um, and there are they're they're very they're run by a couple of guys in the States who have um, engineered and, and been able to um, take to market a number of different technologies in the past and been very successful with them. So I've got complete confidence they'll be able to do the same with this technology. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah, my, my only worry with those technology events, and I've been bitten in this scenario before, and I'm, I'm fairly sure that you have with the old Atlantis thing right where everyone went out and started selling out Atlantis, Ilio, USX, Hyperscale and all those kind of things and then literally overnight bang business is gone yeah. and all of your customers are like where's my support 
where's this, where's that? And those are, they always make me nervous, but at the same time, I'm conscious that some of those organisations do get bought by the bigger players. <laughs> and that's what the, the game is, right, for eight senses. They're looking to get bought by a Microsoft, HP, Dell, whoever. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I think there's, there's no doubt that that's what they're... And you hope they get bought by the right people um, because mm. sometimes they get bought by the wrong vendor and then you never hear from them again and the technology dies. Um, I think you're right, Atlantis... It, it, it what was interesting about that was um it's still great technology <laughs> it's still fantastic what the fact he was able, able to run uh storage in memory is amazing um it's there's just, intelligence it's behind that but uh yeah just it, it just did the, the storage market caught up eventually and he he, he tried to take on um emc and yeah. all the big storage players unfortunately i think the biggest mistake that organization made was trying to branch out of the workspace arena mm. like trying to become a data center player in a, in, in, and it sounds horrible to put it this way because the guys there were really clever right and we all know like so jim moyle and and the various guys that were there but they are known for their workspace yeah. engagements and community involvement right so when you then go and speak to a data center team about resiliency and failover times and things that we can kind of account for within the workspace arena and they can't in the data center. It just, it was only ever going to fail. And I know that you can still buy it for anyone that's interested in it by Hive, um, <laughs> right? You get a, um, a, a marginal level of support, <laughs> um, but it is available if people are still interested in buying that product. Uh, I would mm. personally probably look elsewhere to something <laughs> that's probably going to be around for a bit longer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, what's more is like, you, you've got to sort of say that even even from that, even from a, a storage perspective, that that's it's not that it's a dying market, but everyone's looking at cloud now. So you've, you know, if you are a, a storage vendor, they've even got cloud messaging, uh, and yeah. they're being judged on what their cloud messaging is doing. So yeah, you, it's a that's a tough market to 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 enter into now. I think it's more around data management now, right? So where this data is going mm. to sit, how it's consumed, and all that kind of stuff, and thinking of data as a, as a platform layer rather than as a spinning disk or non-spinning disks and all that kind of stuff. So I think that industry's got a long way, Polygon's got a long way to go. Um, I think it's getting better with some of the announcements that have come out recently. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a mindset change, I think, for people to, I think for a lot of people take, pick on NetApp, right? People think of NetApp, you think rusty spinning disks. Until you then look at their cloud portfolio, right? And you look at like the cloud jumper spot, um, the talent acquisition they made for global file caching services and all that kind of stuff. And it starts to expand that message a bit more, but they've been really bad at marketing it. <laughs> People still yeah. see them as a storage business. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and they've got a really good play in Azure, you know. Um, it's, uh, it, they, they could be so much better than they are. Uh, There's a big frustration for me with NetApp, but uh, yeah. yeah, that's the problem. It's, it's overcoming that reputation. Yeah, 100%. It's like the, the guys from Citrix trying to say they're not a, an application and delivery platform, right? I mean, it's, they're only a, always going to be known as an application and desktop yeah. platform for the best one in the world. The only way they're getting rid of that is not to rebrand the Citrix logo, is to rebrand the entire company. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and yeah, what a horrible logo as well. Um, I, I'm not going to comment. I've made my views on this very well known. <laughs> um, cool. So on... In technology, obviously, there's, there's parts of, of tech that are kind of like an unsung hero, right? So I, I take the, an example here of, of Microsoft Flow, right? Most people have it as part of the 0365 license or M365 licensing. Is there any parts of technology that you think that is unsung that people should be making, taking more advantage of that they don't today? Um, I, think, I think we're probably going to see this change um, because... You know, whenever, whenever, um, whenever there was an issue beforehand, uh, like you, you felt there was a security vulnerability, uh, you, you, you'd sort of perhaps get um, some kind of test done on your infrastructure, and then you'd address all of the security vulnerabilities that were mm. made by that assessment. Um, and then you perhaps would do the same sort of assessment for your EUC environment, and you'd address all of those challenges one of the things that i feel that people aren't doing is looking at constant change like constant monitoring um, mm. and i think this is 
something that is going to change. Um, I think the tooling is getting a lot better. Um, I think the monitoring that is becoming uh, available is a lot better. There's some incredible monitoring tools out there, but it's a very, you know, you could go from application monitoring to, um, you know, container monitoring to, you know, user monitoring, to user behavior monitoring, to infrastructure monitoring. There's so much that you mm. can get confused by. Um, and I think what organizations don't value is, 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 is actually sort of making sure that they look into the right areas of monitoring for their business. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, I think that is going to change, especially in the current climate, because you haven't got that visibility that you need uh, to be able to really see what your users are doing and see what your users not necessarily are up to, but to, to understand truthfully what, what how things are performing for them. Um, yeah. What's the productivity impact, right? What, 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 can, what tactical changes can you make to make them more productive? That kind of thing, yeah. Um, so I think that's, it's an undervalued, I mean, monitoring's always been an undervalued uh, mechanism. The first business. thing that comes out of every budget. Yeah, well, every project. exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think uh, it, it's. I, I think that's an area of technology that people they don't necessarily invest in. They should, um, because of the reasons I just sort of stated at the beginning. You know, they do it as like a right. Let's have an assessment of what things look like, and then they make an investment. Actually, they should reverse them. They should just sort of have a look first of all, uh, monitor things. And then off of the back of that, they can make a sound, a better investment going forward. Mm. Um, you know, people's infrastructure, it, it, they were so bolted and so, uh, you know, uh, protected beforehand. And I think we're, we're, people are sort of regretting a lot of decisions they've made, especially with what, what the things look like now. It's more about endpoint security. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I think that, that, that there's a lot to be said for that kind of monitoring. Yeah, I think... On monitoring, the issue with monitoring generally is that it becomes shelfware because it gives you too many false, false positives and people don't understand it and how to tweak and change it. And I think that's where the, the rise of things like AI ops and things are coming in, right? So using artificial intelligence and machine learning to, to get a better handle on that data so you're not having to make decisions yourself as an individual and just getting better insights, right? And I think if we take the announcement from VMworld, and I've mentioned this a couple of times with the democratization of AI, right? And being able to give that at different levels at a cost-effective point, I think embedding AI into a lot of these services um, is going to make them more usable, especially to the point where people don't use them to turn them into shelfware. The worry, though, is, is that it makes it more expensive and then people still don't buy it. <laughs> yeah, there is that. There is that. And, and I mean, it, it can be. It can become a minefield so as, as you kind of need to start thinking about how you whittle down and get access to all the logs in, in a readable fashion you need some kind of tool that's going to do that and, and that could become expensive and you know if you you're doing all of this in cloud that's expensive it, it, it's yeah it's never ending sometimes so i think you're right um i think it, a lot of it will start to mature um and the, the vendors are saying the, the things that are mm. sort of resonating i think with with that kind of stuff with ai and being able to understand a lot more without you having to really put the intelligence behind it. If it's automated and it's there already, then it gives you something to, to go on. Well, you haven't got a product nowadays, right? Unless your PowerPoint deck's got AI and ML mentioned in it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Very so let's, let's go into the uh, lightning round. Um, so last technology you purchased. I'm really boring, right? So uh, when lockdown happened, um, I went out and bought a milk frother because I needed my cappuccino fix. So, you know, it wasn't going to go into London or the office. I needed, uh, I needed frothy coffee. So uh, that, was, that was my best and last technology purchase. Fantastic. And your, your biggest inspiration other than Costa Coffee and Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, do you know, there's, there's a lot of people who've, who've influenced my, me through my career. There's a lot of people I've worked with who I could sort of call out. Um, but you know what keeps keeps me going? What sort of makes me um, uh, makes me go to work and and reminds me of what's more important is my children. You know, it's it's kind of like I can't I can't deny it. That's the reason we 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 do this at the end of the day. You have to sort of look back to it all, 
um, and understand why you're why you're doing all of this. And you know, they they were a good reminder of of what's important to me in life. Anyway. Yeah. On on the back of that, so what would you class as work life balance? Um, well, if you work too much, what's life? You know, if, if you don't get to enjoy life because work is consuming all your time, it's not worth it. Um, if you love your job, that's great. Um, but if you're doing too much of it and it's taking over your life, are you actually getting to enjoy what's more important in life? And I think that's that's where the balance comes in. You know, there's, there's a lot to be said. We've all done times where we have worked probably 24 hour chunks in the mm. past. You know, we've been in a data center at midnight, crying our eyes out because something isn't working. There's, there's been times where we've all been in those scenarios um, and we don't want to go back to them. And they are one-offs a lot of the time, but you, you do have to make sure that you, if, if that's happening too often, as much as you might love your job, is it really worth it? Um, I've, I've had friends who have been on, on in global roles where they are flying here, there and everywhere um, constantly. And as much as that sounds like a really sort of uh, great lifestyle, when, when they start to question it and start to think about it, they realise I haven't got much of a life here and all the money I'm earning, I'm not getting to enjoy either. Um, so that that's where you, you've got to sort of balance it out for me. Yeah, definitely. What do you say is your favourite book, assuming that you read? <laughs> um, there's a uh, a guy who um, coined the phrase IOT, um, and he uh, is a guy called Kevin Ashton. He, he wrote a book once called How to Fly a Horse, and uh, it's a it's a very very recommended read because um, it talks about um, how anyone can be an innovator anyone can be an entrepreneur um it, it doesn't it, you don't have to be from a spectacular background you don't have to have a degree and you know you don't have to be uh, someone that's born into a lot of money and, and had a huge wonderful education to be the, the the leading innovator out there it can come from the simplest of things and the examples he gives really sort of fill you with encouragement that actually you as an individual you've got some great ideas too and, and it's all about you just pursuing that so yeah well worth a read how to fly a horse by kevin add, uh, add that to me i'm as in less to think i've not, I've not read that one um words of wisdom if it was in a tweet stealing that from simon's uh question <laughs> <of> the week, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> yeah and i'm not gonna do um uh, who was it that was on the, the call with us from softcat I'm, I'm not gonna do his response but it's more like an email <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I keep my tweets short. Um, if I was to tweet a, uh, a word of wisdom, it would be question everything. That'd be it. Perfect. <laughs> and and, and that's, that sort of applies in everything, every walk of life, you know? So um, if, if someone says something, question, question it. Don't have to ask, you know, question it physically, but question it in your head. Um, mm -hmm. If someone states a fact, question it. Don't believe everything you hear just because it's said in a book or on a TV program or on YouTube, or someone tells you it's a fact, you know. Don't unless you unless it's me and my YouTube channel. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> yeah, if only. Um, so favorite song at the moment? Favorite song. Um, do you know, I'm, I'm terrible at remembering what the names of songs are. You're more than but, welcome um, to sing it, mate. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's like uh, my my daughter is so into TikTok at the moment that there's all these uh, funny da dances she comes out with where she's sort of doing all this and yeah, um, yeah, it's so uh, it's one of the it's, TikTok songs, then, right? It's got to be one of those TikTok songs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and fill, fill in the blank, right? The new normal is the new normal. Um, I think it's the new normal is we're going to be more conscious of hygiene now than we've ever been in our entire lives. It even, it, I mean, even if things do go back to some kind of normality with, you know, we don't have to wear masks and we don't have to social distance anymore. And, you know, we can hug each other and everything. Um, 
I think we're going to be more wary of hygiene from from now on. Must watch TV show. Must watch TV show. Um, what have I, I'm trying to think what I've seen. I, I'm not one of these that's, that's sort of seen, that's bought into the whole, uh, uh, whatever that was, one was on Netflix about the Tigers. Um, I haven't watched that either yet. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you, if you, I like good sort of uh, cop dramas. So, um, you know, things like Luther for me mm-hmm. is, is a good sort of uh, must see if you haven't seen it. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, of course. Um, but, I, I, you know, um, for, for American stuff, you know, that's, that's where a lot of the, um, a lot of the stuff is, is coming out of a lot of the time. Um, I remember when I first started watching 24, if anyone has ever watched that, how addictive that was to watch. You couldn't put the episodes down and there's 24 of them because it runs a 24 hour uh, period. That that was incredible how much that got you hooked when you watched Amazing on how much they did in those 24 hours as well. That's what that amazed me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> bit old now but they're yeah they're still that I, I remember those they were great your favorite junk food uh do you know it always comes down to um like because everyone loves pizza so that doesn't Thank count you know. but um, thanks my junk food's ready <laughs> um yeah it always comes down to burgers uh i think um me and me and my son we love burgers and we kind of rate them by which brand of burger you go with. So top of the list is Five Guys. Yeah. Um, if you want the burgers, but you have to go somewhere else for the good chips and somewhere yeah. else for the good milkshake. Uh, I'd always say somewhere like Gourmet Burger Kitchen does the better milkshakes than Five Guys. So yeah, but that's that's me. Yeah, love love uh, burgers. Yeah, perfect. I think on that on that burger note, because I'm 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 hungry and I'm ready for my tea and your tea's ready. So let's let's call it a wrap and thank you very much for your time, mate. Mate, really appreciate being able to be invited to do this and all the best with your um, online show. I think it's a great idea. I think um, you know the more people that we can get sort of understanding how this industry operates and the people behind the scenes is is a great idea. So well done um, and thank you so much for inviting me along.